Thank you, Pastor Armacost. Certainly a blessing to be back at Fairhaven. And uh, how many of you were here in 1983? I saw some faces. I was looking, look at all of those hands. What a great testimony. You're here all of these years later, and uh, you're here tonight. Uh, we were saying that on our way in uh, as we were coming in. You know, some things, some things around Northwest Indiana uh, just never change. First trip I ever made up here was the summer of 1983 to come and visit the college on a Saturday. Uh, my mother and myself and uh, my fiance at the time, uh, Julie, and uh, when we got off of that, uh, well, when we got down here on 8094, you know what was happening? Road construction. <laughs> and uh, it's never stopped. That started in 1983. One of these days, they're going to get that finished. And uh, so when we got close up here, I, I said something to my wife. I said, some things just never change, do they? I asked her uh, sarcastically, I said, do you ever remember them doing uh, road construction up here when we lived here? And uh, she laughed kind of about that. But uh, anyway, some things don't change. Uh, that would be a good change, right, if they got that all done and didn't have to do that anymore. But what a blessing it is that Fairhaven stands where it stood when I came here. We came here as students back in 1983. And uh, then as testimony with so many hands that went up. And some of you didn't raise your hand, but I know you were here in 1983. Uh, but uh, what a blessing that you are here all of these years Later, You have your Bibles with you this evening, certainly hope so. We're going to go to Genesis chapter number 25, except for Dr. and Mrs. Mitchell. They go to the book of Ruth, and uh, somewhere, along the, somewhere along the way, I will work something, try, I'll try my, try my best to work something in there for them, especially, I, I might forget later on, but Genesis 25 for all of the rest of us this evening. I, I wasn't quite certain uh, with invitation, it's okay to move this down now after I'm starting, all right, get that out of my face, and uh, there you go, oh yeah, this group out here is uh, looking a, a whole lot better now with that out of the way, I'm probably not, but you are, uh, but uh, uh, now I lost my train of thought, where I was at, yeah. that's what happens when you start aging, right, and uh, before coming over I had to put some liniment on my knee, because I knew I had to come up the steps, and uh, you know you're getting to be an old preacher when you have to Eric, you know, get your knee loosened up to be able to get up the steps to preach. Uh, but uh, with all of that, uh, what a blessing. Oh, uh, the uh, book of Ruth. But uh, we probably won't make our way over there, I don't think. Genesis chapter 25. Here they say, oh, I know what I was going to say. With the advertisement that came out or the flyer or whatever it was, all of a sudden I see this after I'd received my invitation. And then in the mail I get this letter and then there's this flyer thundering Thursdays. I'm like, wow, what, wow, what is this? First, I wondered if it was something like the professional wrestling type stuff, because I know they do that. And uh, then I wasn't sure how I was supposed to dress or come out or anything like that. Thought about some of those skits back in the day, right, Eric? And uh, so I thought, well, I wasn't sure about that. So I have been watching some of the other services. Pastor Burke didn't come out and do anything. I thought, well, I'm not supposed to do that for Thundering Thursdays. I don't know if after the lineup's been through, if all of us preachers will be classified as sons of thunder after this or not. Uh, but then I did think about a time when I was here on staff and I was preaching. I don't recall whether it was a Thursday night service or a Sunday evening service, but a thunderstorm started during the service, one of the big type thunderstorms that knocked the power out. And so the security lights and those things came on, so we were dimly lit. Some of you are nodding your heads. You remember that now, right? Aren't you thankful the sun's out this evening? Uh, well, we could hardly see, and it rained and rained and rained. And, of course, coming through the college, you know, you read all of those stories about the preachers preaching until the, until the candle burned out and all of that. And since there were still a few lights on, I thought, well, I guess I just keep preaching. I didn't really know what to do, so I just kept preaching. And uh, then I started noticing people that were down here in the front uh, were really paying attention to the altar area. And I didn't know if it was because they were so much under conviction. They were ready to get there, just wanted me to get the sermon over with. With. And uh, then I, I probably stepped to the side, and I started to notice in the dimly lit auditorium, water had flooded in during the preaching and was coming up the aisles. People are not there. How many of you are here? You remember that? That was a, maybe a thundering third. That might have started the whole thing. But, but I know this. I don't remember what the sermon was, but that night when I preached, the, the altar was flooded. And uh, I, I don't know if that's going to happen tonight. I wish I knew what sermon it was because I would have brought that one back. But uh, 
Oh, what a blessing to be here. You found your way, I hope, through all of that to Genesis chapter 25. I want to start with verse 29. Thank you, Fairhaven, for the impact and influence you have had on my life. When I say Fairhaven, I, I mean you as the members, and so many of you know, we know well, and uh, you mean much to us, whether it was as students or through the years of ministry and support uh, for us and prayers in a variety of ways, and then uh, the honor and privilege to have been back here for those seven years and to have been dean of students certainly was a great privilege and a high honor. Genesis 25, beginning in verse 29, And Jacob sod pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Let's have a word of prayer, please, as we begin. Dear God of heaven, again, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for another day that you have given unto me. I'm thankful in this day for the nice weather that we've been able to enjoy in route to be here for this service this evening, but also in the beautiful evening you've given unto us. Dear God, we are thankful. I'm thankful once again for an opportunity to be able to be in the house of God with fellow believers. Thank you for the source of encouragement and strength we can find from fellowship with one another, but also the opportunity that we have to worship together. We thank you for the opportunity to sing tonight and the special music that is ministered unto us. And God, I hope, has begun to direct our thoughts and our attention unto thee. I thank you for this opportunity tonight to be able to be back at Fairhaven, so to speak, and to be able to preach to these dear people. God, you know my heart's desire and burden for some weeks now from the invitation and the acceptance of it is just to be a blessing as you've intended. I would pray thus tonight that as your word is given, you would guide and direct my thoughts, my words. They would be what you once said, and may your word not then return void, but accomplish its purpose in our lives, in our midst tonight. We do pray and ask all of these things now in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. I read a story about a man back in the spring of 1991. He was out in the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, he liked to go to flea markets, and so he made his way to a particular flea market that was there in his neighborhood. And as he browsed through all of the items that were there, those of you that like to do that type of thing, and I've got some family that like to do that type of thing, you know, you're always trying to go through all of that, well, everybody else is trash, find some kind of treasure, right? And uh, as he made his way through all of the items that were there, he didn't really notice anything that stood out to him. But then all of a sudden, over in the corner, he noticed, well, it was really kind of a, not a very good picture that somebody had painted, a painting there, and it was really kind of dreary and all of that, and, but the thing that he noticed about it was the frame that it was in, and the frame, according to the article, was very ornate, and so he thought, well, I, I'll see if I can bargain with them in order to buy that, because I really would like to have the frame, I'll just discard that painting that's in there and use the frame for something else. So he went about his business, and after uh, going through all of that, he was able to purchase that for $4. <laughs> Some of you say, oh, I'd never go that high, right? Uh, but uh, he did, and he thought that the frame would be worth that. So he made his purchase, and he took it home, and sure enough, uh, he began to pull out and discard the old painting that was in there. Uh, he then had decided, well, even the frame itself wasn't even worth keeping, and so he had wasted away $4 out of his pocket. Not a lot, but he was feeling kind of bad about that. But as he had taken off that painting, he had found something. It looked like an envelope to him at first. But as he took that out and began to unfold that, it was not an envelope. Matter of fact, it was a copy of the Declaration of Independence. He didn't think much of it at the time. He just thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. I wonder why somebody stuck that behind here. Discarded the other items, but kept that. Short time later, he showed it to a friend. His friend got really interested in that copy of the Declaration of Independence and said, hey, I, I know some people. Why don't we give them a call and see if we could bring that over there and show that to them? Uh, they did that. The place is called Sotheby's. And uh, as they went there, those people got very, very excited. They began to go about a process of authentication 
of that Declaration of Independence, it wasn't one that you would buy if you go to Philadelphia now and just go in one of those souvenir stores. And you might get that one. I was going to say $4, but they charge a lot more than that souvenir stores. This actually was one of the original copies of the Declaration of Independence. There were not a lot of those that were put out at that time. This one here, as they began to examine it, had been so fresh when it had been folded up uh, that the beginning portion of it in the ink had actually bled over to the other side. It had been perfectly preserved because somebody, at whatever point in time, had decided that they would stick it behind this dreary old country scene painting and keep it there. About a year later, that went to auction there at the Sotheby's. They thought, as it went, that it would probably sell for around $800,000. Thing is this, they were wrong about that. The final price in the auction for that copy, original copy of the Declaration of Independence, was $2,420,000. Yes, $2,420,000. $420,000. And a man had purchased it for $4. Seems as if the people at the flea market really didn't know what they had, did they? I mean, they just had a picture of a dreary country scene and a frame that maybe somebody would want, and they put a price on it of $4. They, in a certain sense, even as we come back to our passage and see in the final verse that we read this evening in verse number 34, we were told this, Esau despised his birthright. It seemed as if somebody, without knowing what was behind that painting, despised what they had and had sold it for so little when in all actuality it was worth far, far more than they could have ever imagined. Using that thought tonight and even that illustration, I'd like to take the next moments and time to preach to you on this subject, the blessing of the birthright. The blessing of the birthright. Let's start off, first of all, with a description of the birthright. The birthright, even as we find indicated here and elsewhere through the Old Testament, in particular to the people of Israel, the Jewish people, well, it carried certain privileges for the firstborn, and for them that was the firstborn son. Among those, and you might be familiar with some of them, uh, the first of those that we would mention in the privilege of the birthright would be this, that they were consecrated unto the Lord. Exodus 22, 29b, second half of that verse tells us this, the firstborn of thy sons shalt thou give unto me. That was the Lord that was speaking unto them, and the Lord had indicated that the firstborn of those sons, it's going to then be taken uh, through their laws into the animals as well. But the firstborn of those sons in particular was to be given unto the Lord. The firstborn was consecrated, set apart, separated for God. That's a privilege of the firstborn. Also, one of those privileges would be that the firstborn, and maybe you thought of this one, received a double portion of the father's estate when the time of his passing came. That was mentioned in Deuteronomy 21, 17. We are told there, but he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. What right? The right that he would receive a double portion of in relation to all of the others that would inherit from the estate of that father at the time of his passing. That's right. That's a privilege of the firstborn. A third part of those privileges would be this. That firstborn would inherit the authority of the father when the father passed away. Now, that really was twofold. One aspect of that would be what I've labeled as a judicial authority over the family. He's going to be the one now that takes the headship in authority over the family. He's going to be the decision maker Okay, I can, it's not in the notes, but I can slip in the book of Ruth right there. Because uh, when Elimelech died, and uh, well, the authority passed down to uh, Malon, and then Chilion, and then there were no boys left, and Naomi decided to head back, there, uh, back home. So there you go, Mitchells, there's your Ruth. This will not be a ruthless sermon tonight. <laughs> the firstborn would inherit that judicial authority as the head of the home. He's the decision maker. He also, though, was going to be the spiritual or should be the spiritual authority in the home as well. In an aspect of the priest of the home, 
it would fall upon him and his shoulders. Thus, because of these privileges of the firstborn, the Jewish people then had attributed a sacred importance to the one who was the firstborn. In our passage tonight, we know this. We're probably familiar with the story. That's Esau and not Jacob as the children, the sons of Isaac. Let's also make mention here as we get started about the pictures or maybe the symbols or types of the firstborn. With the firstborn, and we put preeminence in this aspect, uh, talking about the type or symbol, well, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the firstborn. He's the only begotten Son of God, and thus the firstborn in type would represent the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It goes beyond that, though, for in Exodus 4.22 the Lord told, or God spoke unto Moses and said this, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. We have another type symbol in this, a picture of the firstborn in relation to the people of God, the children of Israel, the Jewish people. But it doesn't stop, it doesn't end there. There's another picture, type, or symbol concerning the firstborn, and that would be for, well, for the church. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 23, there it's written saying this, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Well, this idea of the firstborn carried forward in the types or symbols, the pictures of that, of Christ himself, of the nation of Israel, the people of God, and also for us then as the people of God as believers today, they're in Hebrews titled as the church of the firstborn. Well, how would that be true? Well, those in the church of the firstborn are those who have received, first of all, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I certainly hope that's you tonight. I know for myself, my personal testimony, I might share something to that in a moment, but I know that's true of me. We have been made a part, or we are made a part of the church of the firstborn when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Those who have first received Him, born again into the family of God, we also would find along with that that these are those who would be called the first fruits in Christ. James speaks about that in James chapter 1 and verse number 8. He says it this way, Of His own will begat He us with the word of truth, that we should be the kind of first fruits of all his creatures. The first fruits. Who's that? Well, that's that church of the firstborn. Who's that? That's those that James said, out of his own will. Well, you're probably familiar with the verse found over in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9, right? Uh, there we are told that the Lord is not long suffering, or the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. My friend, if you're here tonight and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's a great desire on behalf of God who sent His Son to suffer on Calvary's cross as the Lamb of God as a sacrifice for you and your sin. There's a great desire on behalf of that God who loves you that much. That in his will, he's desirous of you repenting of your sin and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. Of his own will, it's not his will that any should perish. Amen. Well, he then told us, James told us, as the Holy Spirit had him write, how did he do that or how does he do that? He does that with the word of truth. So, in your mind, you might go over to Romans chapter 10 for a moment. There's a great listing of verses there, but it summarizes itself in verse number 17 of Romans 10 when we are told, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, doesn't it? Of His own will, because it's not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He begat us again. How? In a second birth. Into what? The church of the firstborn to be this body of believers. And He does so through the Word of truth, and through that Word of truth in particular, the preaching of the gospel message concerning the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And upon hearing that, oh, the Spirit of God does a work in our lives where we fall under the conviction of sin as we would speak of it. And, and then we confess that sin and call upon Him. And all that call upon Him, well, He will in no wise cast anyone out that will do that. My friend, again, if you're here tonight and, 
and you've never done that in your life, a little later on there's going to be a time and an opportunity and an invitation for you to come and to find out more about what it means to be saved and on your way to heaven. I certainly would hope if you haven't done that that you would do that even tonight. Could I give you a personal testimony from a firstborn? <laughs> That's literal for me. I'm the firstborn child in my family as such. I'm a firstborn son. I happen to be an only son with three sisters that follow behind. With that idea of a firstborn and a testimony from a firstborn, I would first say this, I indeed was born. The jokes would be sometimes, well, somebody might have been hatched or this or that or the other, but no, I was. I've got proof of that, mind you, if you needed to see it. I didn't happen to bring it with me tonight. I didn't know that I would need to. But I could take you to a safe deposit box at the bank in Pittsfield, Illinois, and open that box up and take out a birth certificate. That birth certificate is going to show that at Pike County Hospital in Louisiana, Missouri, back on December 4th of 1964, uh, there was a son, a, a boy that had been born uh, that day to Charles and Kay Love. And, and I was that boy. <laughs> I was there. I really don't remember it. Uh, but I've got proof of it because, well, I've, I've got the birth certificate now and I keep it in a safe place. A record of my birth. My birth that day was that I was born into a family that has the last name of Love. Now, for those of you potentially that are new this evening and have never uh, seen me or heard me, and maybe you've heard about me, I don't know if you should really believe all of those things, but... Uh, you might have thought even as, as maybe the flyer came out and maybe even as it was being announced, you know, there, there's, a, there's this preacher who's going to be preaching on Thursday night. He's, he's Pastor Love. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. That's fine. I'm used to it by now. That's been happening for nearly 34 years since I was ordained in ministry. Pastor Armacost talked about the idea of uh, Julie and I going to plant Old Paz Baptist Church so many years ago right out of Bible college, well, a few months out of Bible college. Uh, we were door knocking one day and knocked on the door and a young lady about our age had answered the door. I was introducing us. I said, hello, I'm Pastor Love and this is my wife, Julie. I got about that far and uh, she, was, she was standing in the doorway laughing. And uh, so I stopped. I mean, you know, what are you going to do? And she began to, to, she began to apologize for laughing. She's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And uh, then she said, if you don't mind me asking, is that really your name, Pastor Love? And I said, well, uh, yes, it is. And, and, and she actually kind of laughed or chuckled again. And then she said, well, could I ask you another thing? I said, sure. She said, well, has that always been your name, or did you change it to that when you went into ministry? And uh, I said, no, 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 that's always been my name. I didn't, I, when I got ordained, I didn't change my name and become Pastor Love. Uh, I was born into that family. I was born a love. At the age of seven, while attending Calvary Baptist Church in nearby Bowling Green, Missouri, we'd been going there for some months and began to hear the gospel as a boy being preached, really for the first time with regularity in my life. And on a Sunday morning, September 17th of 1972, at the end of that service that day, I did what I encouraged potentially someone else to do tonight. When an invitation time was given, a little seven-year-old boy came out on this side and made his way to the front. The preacher met him right there and said, why have you come? I said, because I need to be saved. Oh, the Spirit of God had finally brought me to the point of recognition that all of those weeks when the preacher had preached about the sinners and the sinners who were going to go to hell, and I had dismissed it as everybody else because I knew I wasn't one of those sinner people. That was everybody. Uh, that day it became me. And that day, as I went off with a deacon into a side classroom off of the auditorium of that church, he took me through the plan of salvation, at the end of which he asked me if I'd like to pray and ask Jesus to be my Savior. And I said, yes, sir, I sure would. I knelt down beside him alongside of the pew that was in that classroom and said some kind of a sinner's prayer. He didn't lead me in a prayer. I prayed. I know I did confess sin. I know I did ask Jesus to save me. And you know what? When I did, he did because he had promised to do that. I was born. I was born into the family of the loves. I'm a love because oh, that's the family I was born into. That day I was born again and I was born again into the family of God. Oh, what a great thing it is to be a child of God. Oh, what a great name I think I have in the name of love, but what a greater name I think I even have, and we have, generally speaking, with the idea that we are a Christian, as we often 
label ourselves. Now, we know that those in the Bible didn't start to call themselves that. Other people called them that because they saw them living a life like that man, Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ. And they begin to call them Christians. Oh, listen, that's not a name to be ashamed of. Oh, certainly for those of us that are loves, at times we might have to endure some measure of ridicule or laughter because of all of that. I think the only time I was really super embarrassed about that uh, would have been when I was in college. Uh, some of you have heard me tell the story before, but those who haven't, I'll tell it again. Uh, we were on a basketball trip. After the game, I had... Uh, made my way out uh, to the van before everybody else, uh, Joe LeBate and all of the others. And so by getting there first, that meant I got to ride shotgun. <laughs> uh, the other seat in the front of the van, the other guy's got a pile in the back. And uh, we drove up the road a little ways, and then Dan DeLong pulled off for us to get some food. I think we were at a Wendy's. Again, being in the front of the van with, with uh, Pastor DeLong, I was the first one out, first one in line at Wendy's. <laughs> And I got my food, they put it on the tray, I went over, found a place in the restaurant and sat down. I was off to the side a little bit in a corner area, and uh, Pastor Long was right behind me in line. When he got his tray and started to walk out with it, he started <sighs> right there in the restaurant saying this, hey, love, love, where are you, love? <clears throat> Because a number of people just called me by my last name. In the day and age we're living in now, please don't do that unless you're my wife. <laughs> I, I'm going to be honest with you. I was sitting there and I wanted to respond to Pastor Long. I wanted to say, hey, Pastor Long, I'm over here. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. Because I saw other people in the restaurant looking around to try to find the love this guy was looking for. Unfortunately, I didn't jump up and run out of the restaurant. I stayed in my seat. And about that time, he turned and saw me, and he said this, Oh, there you are, love. <laughs> and walked over and sat down right across the table from me. And I'm pretty certain right then I was blushing. <laughs> oh, but I'm glad to be a love. But even greater than that, I'm glad to be a Christian born again into the family of God. You know, part of that experience then, as we saw a little bit earlier over in the book of Hebrews, is then in becoming a believer, born again of the family of God, we were also then born into that church of the firstborn. That's a body of believers that we are now a part of. But in particular, at this moment in time, we would find ourselves, as we understand it, in the local church age. And when I look back and think back upon it, I think all the way back to what I talked about a little bit earlier ago, back in 1972 when I got saved. When I got born again, or those of you from the South, when I got born again, all right, uh, that, that, that was at that Calvary Baptist Church in Bowling Green, Missouri. That Calvary Baptist Church in Bowling Green, Missouri was an independent, fundamental Baptist church. Is that okay to say that? I don't know. I was to make sure. Uh, but, it, but it was an independent, fundamental Baptist church. And that's the church that I was born into, I'm going to say it this way, and then I'm going to explain it, by the Father's pleasure. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the chapter is going to deal with spiritual gifts. But as you get down to verse number 18 in that chapter, we're going to find that the Bible tells us this, but now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. As it hath pleased him. You know, the general idea today for a lot of people is that the idea they go out shopping for a church. You know, I'm going to go visit this church, I'm going to go visit that church. For us now in Pittsfield, Illinois, people might come and visit us. Well, they're going to see what we offer as compared to what other churches in the community might have to offer. What kind of programs do you have for the kids? And what are you doing with this? And what are you doing with that? And it's kind of become like, like car shopping, I guess, is, is to go out church shopping and, and to just find out all of those. But really, to be quite honest with you, there's nothing spiritual in doing it that way. The Bible's going to show us very clearly that God sets the members. He sets the members. And he sets them in a church. We're talking about the local New Testament church. And he sets them there as it pleaseth him. So using that, and I think about all of this, and we're building to something here at some point in time. 
But I thought about that. I was born in love, and then I was born again and became a Christian. I was born into this church of the firstborn in the body of believers. But right now, and when I first got saved, God had me, as it pleased him, to find his son as my savior in an independent, fundamental Baptist church. I think there's significance in that. I really do. I think if God wanted me to be something else, listen, there's other people that preach the gospel. Can we, can we agree with that? I mean, the gospel, not another gospel, which is not another and all of that, and Pastor Armour calls to get through the Greek and get you to figure that all out. But I'm saying there's other people just like us and just like Fairhaven that preach the gospel. And people in those churches are saved, just like we're saved. All right? Pastor Smith agrees with me. I don't know nobody else does, but we're not the only ones, right? But if God in his providence had the gospel come to me in my life, and in my life it was going to be in that particular type of church, I, I really believe all these years later that God had an intention in all of that for, for me and, and my life. I think that's what God wanted me to be. And I believe that's still what God wants me to be. In spite of all of the people that post this, that, and the other, and, and the IFB this, and all of those things. Listen, are we saying we're perfect? I hope not. But God has a purpose in all of that, I think. i, I, I got to get back to my notes. Now, Pastor Armacost, right before I came up here, said I could preach as long as I wanted. And I don't want to take him up on that. But So the description of the birth right, the privileges thereof, the pictures, but then a personal testimony for me as that flows down from literally being a firstborn son in a family called the loves, but being a child of God born into the family of God and where that happened. Let's then go into this. Back in verse number 34, we saw at the end of the verse that Esau despised his birthright. I'm going to talk about the despising of the birthright secondly. To define that, the idea of despise, first of all, means to disesteem. What Esau did concerning his birthright as the firstborn son of Isaac is he disesteemed it. So he did not have esteem for it. It's going to be this idea. He did not regard it, and the way he did regard it is he regarded it with disfavor. Really? That doesn't make sense to me. The things I spoke about a little bit ago in the description of the birthright. If you are that son, if you are that, and you get these privileges because you have it, why, why would you look at that with disfavor? That, that, that's not rational to me. And maybe it's not supposed to be rational, I don't know. But he did not regard it, or he did not esteem, and instead he regarded it with disfavor. In simplicity, we would just say it this way, he disliked it. He disliked his birthright. He didn't like the fact that he had this because he was the firstborn son. The word also means to disdain it. So that's to think about it with scorn. To me, that goes beyond the level of just disliking something. If you scorn something, I mean, you really don't like that, do you? Eh, could be some people who maybe like certain baseball teams other than the Cubs. I don't know. But to scorn, think of another place in the Bible where that idea of disdaining from one person to another, you would find that being spoken about in the story concerning David and Goliath. You'd find that when David came out on the battlefield to go and challenge this mighty champion, that the Bible then tells us, 1 Samuel 17, 42, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. Esau despised his birthright. He didn't like it. And he even scorned the fact that he had it, that it was his. How is this demonstrated? If you would look back in verse number 32 for a moment. First of all, I would find that he demonstrates his displeasure about owning the birthright in his words. In verse number 32, Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? Now, if you're still watching and looking here, look at verse number 31. When Jacob had spoken to him, he had asked him to do what? Sell me this day thy birthright. Jacob knew who it belonged to. He knew who was the possessor of it. It was his older brothers. He was the firstborn. And he called it thy birthright. 
Verse number 33, Jacob said and asked him, swear to me this day, swear unto him. And he sold, the Bible then calls it his, meaning Esau's birthright. Again, he possesses it. It's his birthright. Again, at the end, in verse 34, it's his birthright. I found that of interest in looking into this passage and thinking about it, that when Esau himself spoke about that which it was that he had and the privileges connected to it, his disdain and displeasure for this as he looks at it, and he says, in a sense, ah, this birthright. He didn't say, wouldn't you say, if you had something, hey, let's think back for just a moment to that illustration at the start, the guy that finds a declaration of independence in the back of an old crummy picture and then, and then uh, sells it, not for $800,000, $2.4 million. You know, when that guy got that declaration of independence, I would say, oh, this declaration of independence. Man, I, I bet he took really good care of that, don't you? After he found out what it was. He might have had armed security with him when he left Sotheby's and went somewhere else. And, and uh, of course, here's a man who's got something that is, that is invaluable. The birthright and the privileges thereof. And look at his attitude towards that birthright. Uh, this birthright? It shows up in his words, doesn't it? But it didn't just show up in his words. It also showed up in his ways. Again, in back number, uh, verse number 34, Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way, the Bible says. He despised that birthright when he said, I'm not going to go God's way. God's the one who put me in this position. God's the one who gave me these privileges. But you know what? That doesn't mean anything to me anymore. I'll sell this off, I'll give it up, and I'm going to go my way. He despised the birthright, but let's continue in his ways. If you need to, I need to turn a page. Chapter number 26 and verses 34 and 35. We find Esau after the despising of his birthright and going his own way. He's really going his own way. Looky here, chapter 26 at the end of it, verse 34. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Hold on a second. There's a whole lot of problems right there in that verse, isn't there? I'm not in Utah anymore, but, you know, no matter where you're at, polygamy's always been wrong. And uh, he didn't go out and marry just one wife. He went out and married two wives. Why? Because he's going his way. Not did he just marry two wives. Notice where the wives came from. He didn't go out and find some good Jewish girls like he's supposed to and marry one of them. No! Goes out and marries two, not one, but two from the Hittite people instead. He's, he's going his way. Look at the last verse of that chapter and see this next result, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Can I ask you a question tonight? Who were Isaac and Rebekah in relation to Esau? His parents. The man's 40 years old. <laughs> I think we would probably say he's an adult, right? He's on into his life. He's, he's going his way. He's doing his thing. He's, he's marrying. Hopefully he's got a job. And, and he's doing, but, but even at the age of 40, when he's doing those things, the Holy Spirit of God said it was a grief. To the minds of his parents. This man despising his birthright caused discouragement to mom and dad. I don't think adult children necessarily have to obey their parents when they go into adult life. I know that's a major of discussion, and dorm theologians can debate it over there at night before they go to bed with popcorn. But I do know the Ten Commandments still tell us that they are to honor their father and their mother. Esau, what are you doing? You had a birthright. <laughs> you had all the privileges. And on one day, one day you came in and you, you just took this birthright and you sold it off. And now you're going your way. And oh, it only affects you, right? It doesn't bother anybody else. Nobody else gets hurt by this. 
Oh, yeah, they do. What about mom and dad? What does it do to them? His despising of his birthright and his disesteem and disdain for it is revealed in his words and his ways. He despised the birthright, became a discouragement to his parents. Can I take you one more chapter in that thought? Chapter 27 and verse number 41. Genesis 27, 41 tells us, And Esau hated Jacob. I'm going to stop there just again. Some of you are finding that. Ask a moment ago who Isaac and Rebekah were in relation to Esau. You told me that they were his parents, his mother and father. Who is Jacob in relation to Esau? His brother. I mean, his, his brother. And the Holy Spirit of God tells us that Esau hated his brother, because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father at hand, and then will I slay my brother Jacob. This disesteem and disdain that this man had had for the birthright and his despising of it, and, and now the result in going his way and becoming a discouragement to his parents, and even to the point he, he now has reached this level, he desires... He desires to slay his own brother. I come back to the world we're living in today, in the world of, of our churches and the independent fundamental Baptist movement, if that's okay if I call it that. I don't know, I could call it camp. It's camp time, right? Camp's going on. But, but somebody's going to have to explain to me why it is that people who God had born again and born again in our churches and has a plan and a purpose for them in their life, didn't have them born again at the Southern Baptist Church or over at this uh, uh, Bible church. Or, again, there's other people preaching the gospel. But in our churches that then all of a sudden decide they're going to go their way and do their thing, and then when they're out there doing all of that, not only bringing discouragement and hurt and grief of mind to the parents and maybe others that have invested so much in them, but I don't understand then why they have to attack all of the other brethren that are still there and trying to do what's right. Was Jacob perfect? Somebody tell me no. He was far from it. But I'm going to tell you what, by the time we get over here in a moment to the book of Hebrews, we're going to find this brother here listed in the hall of faith. And we're going to find mention of Esau in Hebrews 12, the chapter after that. I really don't, I, I just don't understand it. Maybe I am getting too old. I don't understand it. Amen. Why do you want to attack the other brethren? Why do you, whether it's, you know, it's not literal in wanting to slay or kill them, but why do you want to slay them with your words? Why do you want to run them down with your words? Why do you want to mock and ridicule all of those things that they are and and you were, I don't, I just don't understand it. I cannot understand it. The despising of the birthright. He disesteemed and disdained it, demonstrated in his words and in his ways. Thirdly, lastly, a delusion about the birthright. Turn back to where we were in that last verse of chapter 25 had told us that he did eat and drink and rose up and Went his way. <laughs> Sounds kind of simple, doesn't it? Sounds like maybe something that some of us have done at times right down the road here. Here's an advertisement for George's. And yeah, we go in there and what do we do? We, we sit down and I tell you what, it's a whole lot better than bread and lentils. I know that much, you know. Nothing wrong with a good pot of beans and some cornbread, mind you. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, that entire beef sandwich you're going to get down there and get some mozzarella on it. Uh, Pastor Vogelins is going to be really wet because it drips off of his arm while I sit across the table and eat from him when we've done things like that. All right? Some of you are getting real hungry right now, aren't you? <laughs> but he just, he, he went, he sat down, he ate it, had his drink, and then he got up and, oh, he just, he just went his way. There's a delusion here, at least in the mind, I think, of this man Esau, that nothing of consequence had just happened. Big deal. So what? I don't have 
I don't have this birthright anymore. <laughs> Younger brother's got it now, but that's no big deal. So had nothing of consequence really happened? Might have seemed like it to Esau, but the writer in Proverbs, the Holy Spirit and human writer he used, said this in Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Might have seemed right at the moment. This is a good thing to do. I'm really hungry. And, and he's got some soup going over there. And Hey, who cares about this birthright? Years ago in our church down in Jefferson City, some of our initial converts that we had, a family of three, <laughs> had come in, they'd gotten saved, baptized, they'd gotten involved, they were in our ministries. The, the man, the husband was even uh, our first bus driver actually that we had in the church when we started the bus ministry. Along the course of the way, some things had happened in their family and, and uh, they were on the outskirts and Mrs. Love and I were spending a great deal of time with them trying to help and counsel and, and then at a certain point, they just, well, they just rose up and walked away and went their own way. And man, that was heartbreaking. Whew. It really hurt. After a while, and some of the responses we had had from them, even my dear sweet wife had one time made a comment to the effect that she said, I feel as if we ought to go to their house and apologize for preaching Christ to them and seeing them get saved. Seems like in their mind, we've ruined their lives because they became Christians. And it certainly seemed like that. Time went along and things happened to that family, unfortunately. I mean, bad things happened. A teenage daughter ended up pregnant out of wedlock. <clears throat> the dad ended up <clears throat> in prison over in Potosi, Missouri, Brother Archie. Serving time. Of course, God brought us here and then to Utah and all these years had elapsed. It's just about a year ago, Pastor Golden called me one day. He said, hey, he said, I got a call from, and he named the daughter's name. He said she called, wanted to know if I knew where you were. He said her dad is, he'd gotten out of prison but he was very, very ill and was literally by the doctors only given a couple of weeks left to live. And he said, she called me and said her dad's been asking her and their mom if you could find out where Pastor Love was at. <laughs> According to what the daughter said, he had told them, he said, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear Pastor Love preach one more time. I'd love to hear him preach one more time. Mr. Golden told her where I was, and of course, due to COVID, <laughs> I was out there on the internet. Because pre-COVID, uh, I, I wasn't broadcasting anything. Right. No, not me. Clint Ammon, before, before we both ended up leaving Utah, he had jokingly said, some pastors got uh, dragged into streaming services uh, he said, I won't say kicking and screaming, and then he looked at me. <laughs> he said, but they did get dragged into it. That was me. I didn't get, I wouldn't get, due to COVID, we're, we're, we're streaming services. Pastor Golden told her, you can go to this Facebook page for Anchor Baptist Church and put that on, and your dad can hear Pastor Love preach. <laughs> he passed away a couple weeks later, and the daughter got back in touch with Pastor Golden. Said, my dad's been laying there on his deathbed and listening to all those sermons Pastor Law's been preaching. They're broadcasting on Facebook Live or now on our web page. Well, when he called and told me that, I my mind went back, my mind went back to some people that we saw get saved and and we're going great for God, and God had a plan for them and their life. And I mean, it was exciting. They were involved in the ministries. The daughter, as a teenager, was, was involved. She was going to the Christian school that was there in town, and uh, she'd gone off to camp and, and, and got the camper of the week for the girls. And then seemingly there came a day that they 
they despised that birth and the rights thereof that God had given to them. Pastor Golden had called me back and said that that man had passed away. I sat and cried. And I thought, you know what? That wasn't the life God saved them to have here. He saved them, yes, to have eternal life there. But he had also saved them to have an abundant life here. But they went their way. They went their way. The eating of lentils, it said, was thought to be poor living. <laughs> and again, back where I'm at in the community I'm in, you know, like I said earlier, a good pot of beans and ham and beans and some cornbread, and well, that's, that's pretty good eating. Most, I don't want to eat it every day. But it might be mindful of us or, or remind us of the idea of the prodigal son who's off in the far country feasting on the husk of corn that are being fed to the swine because he'd gone his way and he'd wasted his inheritance on riotous living. Praise God, he came to himself <laughs> and went back. But he couldn't get back what he'd lost and the time he had lost. Back to my notes here so I can finish the delusion or a delusion about the birthright, Esau seemingly, seemingly had a delusion that nothing of consequence had happened that day. He was not, I believe, considerate of God's providence in his life. Proverbs 3, 6 tells us, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. He, he didn't acknowledge God in the decision he made there. He made up his own mind to do his own thing and to go his own way. As a result, he alienated himself from those blessings that were connected with the rights of the firstborn. And he also altered his future family. We've already looked at the verses about his marriage or marriages, and it could just continue from there on out because he despised the birthright. Another man who was a firstborn, I'll give you a reference to Reuben. In 1 Chronicles 5.1, altered his future family. Tells us in that verse, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. Listen to the end of the verse, 1 Chronicles 5.1. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. You say, what's that statement all about? Because of what Reuben had done and the forfeiture of the birthright, because he was the firstborn of those 12 sons, that has been passed as God had deemed it unto the sons of Joseph. So now, with Reuben and his genealogy, it's not going to be numbered after the firstborn. If I bring it into the light of this idea and application, his future generations are not going to have what God really wanted them to have or be what God wanted them to be. That's passed off onto Joseph and his family now. Can I say this? Just by perspective, especially in the last maybe 20 to 25 years of ministry, even as we're told amongst, quote, evangelical churches that we've been having somewhere near 75% of the youth that grow up in our churches, that by the time they get to 18 and 22, not only walk away from the church, they walk away from God. To me, again, and the idea of what I'm trying to preach tonight is this. They despise the birthright that God has given them if indeed they truly are born-again believers and a part of the family of God. When they turn away from the church and they turn away from God, they're altering so many things and they are altering their future family. For I can't tell you how many of those that I've encountered along the way, whether it's in the churches I've ministered or others where I've had an opportunity to go and be a part of, whether it's in preaching or some other fashion, where all of a sudden that family that was there and now that generation that's turned away, they're, they're not even taking their kids to church. They're not even saved. Now they're down to the grandchildren and they're not even saved. The genealogy as far as being a part of the family of God is no longer even being reckoned in that family line. I don't know about you. I've got a rich heritage even in my family, the love family. I started finding out about that in my adult life. 
My grandfather passed away when he was only 51, laid down to sleep, never woke up, died of a heart attack. I was just a little boy, six years of age. Come to find out later on, I found out about my great-grandparents and a grandfather who had become blind and on a Friday night in revival services at Ellsbury Baptist Church had, had after being invited all week by my great-grandmother and my grandma and her sisters, as they left that night, had decided, hey, listen, hold on, I'm going to go with you. Felt his way across the room, got his hat and his coat, they said. My grandma gave me the story. Went with them to the service. She said at the invitation time, she said, I can remember it as a schoolgirl. Daddy stood up and daddy felt his way along the edges of the pews down to the front. And the pastor met him there and said, why have you come? He said, because I need to be saved. <laughs> Listen, I found out that in my family, at least going back to great grandparents and down through grandparents and down through my parents and down unto me, there's a genealogy that is being reckoned and numbered one after another. And I'm telling you tonight, I don't want to despise that. I don't want to cast that away. I don't want it to stop with me, the Lord. I know the Lord's coming. But what if he tarries a little while longer? And there's another generation in my family or another generation in your family. Oh, listen, it's far too important. This was a, this was a major decision he was making at this time in his life. It was of great consequence. Not considerate of the providence of God that God had made him the firstborn and God had put him in that family. Mentioned a verse earlier, Hebrews chapter 12. I get you to turn, hold your spot where we're at and I'm going to try to wrap this up. Remember, Pastor Armacaw said I could preach as hard. The delusions about the birthright, at least seemingly in the mind of Esau, that nothing of consequence happened that day. Not considered of God's providence. And look at this in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. Hebrews 12, 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as whom? Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward afterward when he would have inherited the blessing he was rejected for he found no place of repentance though he sought it carefully with tears it's a heavy statement isn't it the delusion that Esau had that day about the decision he was making concerning his birthright was this that he didn't know that afterwards and somewhere down the road somewhere he was going to want to reverse his decision. He was wanting the button that the do-over. He was looking for the time machine to get in and go back and, and do that all over again. But we can't do that. And neither could he. Neither could he. He was never able to reverse this decision. Child of God tonight, <laughs> and if I could place an emphasis, young people of Fairhaven Baptist Church and the families of this church, don't despise the birthright. May not seem like a big deal now, but afterward, afterward, there will be a day. There will be tears. Think of Pastor Jerry Ross's booklet on stay in the castle. <laughs> that young lady in that story. <laughs> she couldn't go back, could she? What's done is done. Can't reclaim that time. You can't, when you sacrifice the birthright, get back the blessings and privileges connected to it when you sold it off. Now God in his grace and mercy, mind you, He's long-suffering and loving. But we don't get back what we gave up. Why did he make this decision? Think about that. I thought about that. Genesis, I told you you could hold a spot there. Genesis had told us what? What was his problem when he came in from the field? Verse 29, he was faint. Verse 30, said, verse 30 he even said it. I am faint. <laughs> What led to him making this decision? 
He was faint. What, what does that mean? Well, faint in the Bible is going to mean, uh, here in this particular instance, he's going to be exhausted or fatigued. He, he, was, he was just tired. You ever get tired? Some of you look like that right now. Yeah, we do, don't we? And you know what? The Bible even tells us in Isaiah 40, and even the youths shall faint and grow weary. Even young people, that happens. He was faint, exhausted, fatigued. 